Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of the Universe Within podcast. Today, I spoke with my friend Tanya. Um, Tanya, like many of my guests, I met working at the Amazonian Plant Healing Center, the Temple of the Way of Light. Uh, she originally came down to to to, to learn about ayahuasca, um, and and very quickly she began working there. Um, she, I, I believe, she ended up starting what's called the the integration program, which is really. Um, how to take what one has learned and, and the insights and the healing that one has learned from working with ayahuasca through ceremonies and then how to apply that back in one's life. So she was specializing in that for a long time, um, but she's been on a really interesting journey herself. Uh, she's gone quite deeply into this work, um, and recently, uh, a couple of years ago, she ended up uh, marrying a Shipibo Cordandero doctor. She now has a child, um, and she's recently started a not-for-profit that's really working uh, in, in many different regards with Shipibo culture, land preservation, uh, medicine, um, food sustainability, so um, really an interesting project. So she talks in this episode a bit about that, a bit about her story and, and plant medicines in general. So uh, she's a really fascinating woman, and I think you all will really enjoy this episode. Um, as always, if you're able to help to support the podcast through donation, either through Patreon or direct donation, that's a really big help. Uh, Patreon is a really good format. Um, you can donate as little as a dollar a month, and uh, there's a few different tiers, and, and with those tiers, you get some really good benefits like early access to shows, uh, bonus material, Q&As, so that's a really big support. Uh, for all of the people who are uh, supporting through Patreon who, or who have donated, thank you very much. Uh, it's very uh, deeply appreciated. Um, if you're not able to do that... Um, uh, going on YouTube to the Universe Within podcast homepage, hitting the subscribe button, uh, turning on the notification bells, liking the videos. That's a really big help with the YouTube algorithms. And for the audio version, uh, Apple Podcasts, start rating and a review uh, really helps to get the show out and to support it. So uh, thank you all. And without further ado, here is the episode with Tanya. So welcome. It's it's uh, it's good to see you. So you're you're coming from uh, Pucallpa or somewhere outside yeah. of there? No, I'm in Pucallpa. I'm in Yurina Cocha, which is oh, nice. a district of Pucallpa. Uh, but yeah, here we are. Yeah. So I met you like pretty much all of my previous guests <laughs> uh, working <laughs> at the the Temple of the Way of Light, um, and you originally came down. Well, actually, I'm, I'm not sure what your, your original role was. I, I guess, I mean, I know you mostly from facilitation. You're the head of the continuing care program, which is kind of like the integration program. Is it still called the continuing care program? <laughs> I'm actually, I think integration program is, has been getting more use. Yeah. Uh, but everything's been on a pause like much of the world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think integration sounds better. I used to joke the continuing care program sounds like a geriatric division of, of the temple. <laughs> <laughs> From now until the end of time. <laughs> so, um, so that's how I met you. And you, I mean, I, I know you're, you're from Canada. Uh, you were the manager at McDonald's for a while, which I think is amazing. <laughs> um, but you, you did a lot of work with Gabor Mate, which, um, I mean, I'm not super familiar with his work, but I know it's, it's a kind of a process of self inquiry. So maybe you can just talk a bit about your, your background, what led you to, to that work, how you got interested in plant work and, and what made you come down to the, the Amazon and the temple originally? Yeah. So yeah, I did work as a manager at McDonald's for some time. Uh, you put me through university studying biology. Uh, I still can't smell a McDonald's, just like I need to be 10 feet 
in the radius of my Wi-Fi for the internet to work here. I can't be within 10 feet of McDonald's <laughs> without wanting to throw up. Uh, yeah, I know that feeling from bartending. I, I can't smell sweet drinks anymore. It's uh... <laughs> uh, Yeah, yeah. And I'm still, you know, they talk about, or I don't know they, but they talk about, you know, when you look back at a successful person's life, all of the different pieces come together and how they feed into everything. I'm not quite sure how McDonald's plays a role in all of this yet, but maybe one day I'll be able to reflect. Um, I might have learned something, uh, but I, I could probably still wrap a cheeseburger really quickly. Um, yeah, but I studied biology. I worked as a fish biologist, fish geneticist for several years. And then one time uh, I realized it was, it was actually at a party uh, and I'd taken mushrooms and I was at this party and I looked in the mirror and I had this great realization, which was actually really profound for me. I want to help people. And the work that I'm doing studying fish is interesting, but it's not helping people. Um, and I had always been looking for something that was a blend of science and art and philosophy. In my undergrad, I took a lot of additional electives beyond what was required to include art, visual art, and high level philosophy and, and as a high level as you can get in an undergrad degree. Um, but really trying to look or create something that was a blend of that stuff. And, and when I realized I wanted to help people, I started investigating how am I gonna do that? And I stumbled upon naturopathic medicine, which seemed to be this already existing blend of science and art and philosophy. And so I studied that. And that in Canada, in the United States, it's, it's a primary health profession. So we're licensed as primary healthcare professionals. The training is a four-year training program. It's really similar to what standard medical doctors get. We learn the same anatomy, science, diagnostics, prescription pills, but get taught to think about how to approach medicine in a different way. So looking to treat root causes, looking to deal with, uh, yeah, what's really underneath an illness and then treat it with plants, with diet interventions, with chiropractic, with acupuncture, wherever possible. Let me just turn off my uh, email. And, and yeah, that ended up bringing me to ayahuasca and I guess I'd been interested in psychedelics for a long time, um, since really young. And, and that was kind of this not yet tied in thing to the, the whole picture. But I went on a retreat with Gabor Mate and, and when I got there, I saw the work that was happening in the daytime, this process work and like, wow, I want to do this. And then when I went into the first ceremony, which was a Shipibo style ceremony, uh, it was run by Westerners, but who had trained in a Shipibo style and I was like, wow, I remember this. So something in the combination of those two things called me really deeply and I started studying that. And it was kind of like a, an access to what naturopathic medicine was pointing at or what was really interesting to me about naturopathic medicine. So talking about getting to the root of things, treating things with nature, looking at energetics and spiritual dimensions of people. Um, but in the context of professionalization, I think a lot of that got lost in the way that people practice naturopathic medicine. Now there's a, a real push towards nutraceuticals to supplementation in a way that's really similar to the way that pharmaceuticals and Western drugs are used. And there's not a lot of deep diving. There's some people, definitely some people, and definitely it's a lot more holistic than, than Western medicine in a lot of cases. But a lot of the time it's a lot, it's like functional medicine and it gets people feeling better, but it doesn't address the core syndrome of what it is to be alive uh, and it definitely doesn't get into the whole societal complex of that and how we're all interconnected um, so as I, I delve deeper and deeper into work with ayahuasca with plant dietas uh, opening up a spiritual dimension that was complementary to a yoga practice that I'd had for a long time but that didn't really take me that deeply um, not that it didn't take me that deeply I didn't take it that deeply I'm not sure but there was a, a world of spirituality that got opened up with ayahuasca practice as well um and yeah just wanting to help people in the best way possible i had been curious about coming to peru for a long time and wasn't sure where i could go that was safe and trustworthy uh i didn't want to just show up in iquitos and and, and look for somewhere as a lot of people do these days 
Um, and, and Deanna actually connected me with Matthew, knowing the, the work that I've been doing, how I've been studying, how I've been supporting people. I had a naturopathic practice and more and more people started coming to me looking for help with integration. A little bit with preparation, but people who had had ayahuasca, specifically ayahuasca experiences, not so much other psychedelics, but ayahuasca experiences, looking for help, how to contextualize that, how to work with that, how to carry that forward in their lives. And that work was really interesting to me. Uh, so I went on a trip to Peru and it, it became to the temple and, and there, there was this access to the jungle and to, and I don't want to romanticize actual indigenous people, but, but indigenous people who are carriers of this medicine, who, who some of them have long family lineages of this and, and who are working in a way that was really more profound to me than what I had experienced up to that point. And, and also just in the, I don't know if it's in the context of society or, or what, but it was important to me to work with, with the mm, traditional carriers of this medicine directly and not secondhand. Uh, so yeah, that's how I came to the temple. And then, you know, there was, this, there was a big opportunity and I started facilitating, started working there, started working in between Canada and the temple and doing a lot of integration support for people post retreat. So people that come through retreats there and from other places, but mostly from the temple who with the same kind of questions, what do I do with this now? I had this really powerful healing or spiritual or personal development experience. And, and now what do I do? Yeah. A, a lot of people come to this work. I mean, you, you were you were a naturopathic doctor before uh, coming to the temple. You, you said that, that came from a desire to help people. Um, I mean, it, it seems like with a lot of doctors, that's the case. And, and it seems like for many people who come to this work, there's there's also something that they're kind of searching for within themselves. For for you, was was it a blend of those two, or was it really just a, a desire to help people, or was there something in yourself you were you were trying to find as well? Yeah, absolutely. But I don't think I knew that at the time, and I think you could really break down this desire to help people and what does that even mean. Uh, but yeah, I uh, from that moment of wanting to help other people, I realized I had a lot of work to do myself, um, and not to say that I I don't still. Uh, you know, it's ongoing. I don't know. I don't know if it's infinite, but something is infinite. Um, but yeah, I, I had never really done a deep dive into myself uh, in my own, my own trauma, but my own self-existence. I think there had been for a long time a sense of something bigger than me or, or in me. Um, and I floated between atheism and agnosticism and and what does that even mean in the context of science and, and life and the people that I know and the relationships that I have. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's, there's something inside that calls to inquiry. What is this? What is this experience of life that I'm having? What is this thing that I'm feeling? What is this that I see reflected in other people? How do I know this? Uh, and so there was, yeah, a lot of layers and peeling back of things that I needed to do. Absolutely. And I think any good practitioner can only take people as far as they've gone themselves. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a really good point. Uh, and I think some, something we, we sometimes overlook. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when, when you started working with ayahuasca, you, you said the, the first time was with Gabor Mate. Um, was that, was it kind of, when you had that, that first or second ceremony, there was something revelational that happened or, or was it kind of a gradual process where you began to kind of begin to, to, to look under these layers of yourself and into this kind of process of, of inquiry? A little bit of both. I think the first ceremony that I had, it wasn't particularly strong, um, but there was something really familiar there that felt like this was a, a road that I can continue exploring on. Um, and throughout, I'm just trying to touch into that first retreat. It's, it, the first retreat had two or three ceremonies. And in those ceremonies, I think what I uncovered was a way that I experienced the world that is unique to me. 
and everybody has multiple versions of that and you can call that lots of different things um but this way that i experience the world that's really personal really unique and really important to me and for me it had to do with synesthesia you know, when i hear really loud sounds or when i have strong emotions and now it's it's changed a bit but there's this experience of color that comes with it and sometimes it's with my eyes open and it's definitely always with my eyes closed but there's this really rich thing that happens and because that's the way that i had always been i didn't even know that it was happening and i didn't know that it was different or unique and on or distinguishing that i guess i developed a relationship with color but also it was more like a, oh wow i have this way that i experience this world that that isn't me but it's personal to me but it's it's like a filter through which things are happening uh and i don't i'm not quite sure how to how to how to talk about it but it it's like discovering a layer of identity and removing that and at the same time it's something that was all, so core that i didn't even know that i had it and the, trying to describe it as a phenomenon that it happens with all people as well. So here's this thing that I didn't even know that I had that when I realized that I had it, I, oh, wow, that's actually really beautiful. Uh, and there's multiple different ways that I am filtering reality as I experience it. Um, but if I can separate myself from that, then who am I? I don't know if that makes sense, but that was part of the the self-identity the self-discovery and then the the call to deeper inquiry that came out of that first retreat and then after that there were a succession of ceremonies where i was uncovering trauma working with trauma things that had happened to me emotional experiences um a series of of childhood stuff that needed to be worked out um yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah that that's a really fascinating thing i um for a while, I got really interested in this guy. His name is Daniel Tammet, and he's an English guy. And he has, a, I think it's a Asperger's um, syndrome. And the, the really fascinating thing about him is he's, he's a lot of people who have that, they, they can be socially a bit awkward. Like it can be maybe hard to communicate them in the way that, that most of us would communicate uh, and he's really interesting in that he kind of trained himself to communicate like kind of normal everyday, maybe you could even say dumb people, <laughs> because he's operating on, on, a, on a very different level, and I would say a really high level. I mean, he can do these amazing mathematical computations, and, but he wrote this book called Born on a Blue Day, because he also has synesthesia, and, and mm -hmm. for him, every day has a certain color, an emotion, a feeling, a shape, a pattern, and it was really interesting, because I remember him saying this thing that he always just assumed that that's how everyone was because we all kind of do that we just assume that <laughs> everyone uh, uh sorry i think my my video just cut out yeah um yeah uh he just assumed that, that that's how everyone was because that's how he was and it was a really interesting moment. And I think a lot of people have that where we realize like somehow our reality is our reality. Like we're, we're always seeing it through our perception. And uh, it, it made me think about when, when I had kind of finished this really long dieting process, um, I, was, I was starting to work more and I was really curious about diagnostic. And I had all these ideas about how to see kind of under the influence of medicine. And, and so in my mind, I had this idea of, of how I thought things should be. And so I, I remember going into ceremony one time and I was like, teach me to see, tell me how to diagnose people. <laughs> and the only message I got was you already know how to do that. And it sounds so silly, but it was kind of revelational. And, and I, I started looking back on my life and I realized that that I was able to see things. It was in my own way. It just wasn't how I perceived that people in this work did it. But mm -hmm. I, I realized I had that and, and that was really empowering for me. Um, 
So yeah, I think that's a big step in, in a lot of people's journey is actually beginning to, to understand how they see the world because we, we do see things very unique and, and we do all have a, a gift in that way. Uh, especially in the beginning when, when I saw you working, it was definitely, you had developed a process of, of maybe we could call it self-inquiry, but, but really kind of looking at people and, and seeing maybe the emotion that came up and, and how that potentially resonated to, to something in their past. What was it about that way of working that, that, that kind of touched you or, or you saw some sort of benefit in that, 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 that allowed mm -hmm. you to maybe work deeper with people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess that could maybe connect to the, the way that we interpret the world because I think there can be these emotional filters or backlogs um so say something happens and there's this emotional experience when you're young so something happens when you're a kid uh, and and there's this emotional experience that doesn't have a chance to process fully that emotion can stay there uh and that emotion can stay trapped or blocked or or backlogged in your system uh and that becomes like a filter through which you see the world there can be this oh your video stopped again uh, yeah. There we go. <laughs> there so maybe there's something that, that had you feel really angry uh, and there wasn't a proper output for that anger. And so there's this experience of anger that stays kind of trapped and overcharged in the system and then everything becomes a lens that can activate or the, there's this permanent lens. Not, it's not permanent. It can be dealt with. But it, and so there's this overreactive anger response that comes with a lot of things. And what that actually has to do with is, is an interpretation and a backlog of experience. So um, why it was appealing to me is that I found it really effective for myself. And, you know, moving beyond it, I think it is really effective up to a certain point. I think there's a certain amount of, of trauma past clearing work, and that can continue, but a certain amount of that that needs to happen for the vast majority of people. Uh, where there's this yeah, disentangling of identity, of trauma, of emotion, of experience, uh, and looking for those ways in which reactions are happening automatically and not in an actual response or dance with the current reality or with other people or the other situations in the environment, but it's happening in response to a past event uh, or in reaction to a past event where something has stayed kind of trapped there. So I found a lot of, of freedom for myself in doing that sort of inquiry. What is this feeling? Where do I feel this in my body? When have I felt like this before? Ah, this came from this moment. And there's other systems of working. You can take that further. Ah, what did I make that mean? Or what's the belief that was created in that moment about myself? Oh, I'm not a good person. Or I'm bad. Or I'm unworthy. Or I'm unlovable. This negative core belief that happens. And then, and then holding that in comparison with an experience that most people have relatively early on in ayahuasca uh, or in meditation or in whatever spiritual practice but this connection this oneness this sense of being loved the sense of being a part of the whole um, is it possible that who i am is unlovable or bad or worthless or any of these things no and so looking at the the emotional over response or over reaction looking at the core belief and how that uh, how that plays into every single moment when that's the pattern that's or that's the program that's running the show uh, and then really taking responsibility for that and I think that's the biggest most important key is really taking responsibility for my own experience looking at the ways that things in my past things in in my head <laughs> things in my body are contributing to the way that I'm interpreting reality and affecting my experience and other people and trying to just slow that all down and be like, oh, what's actually happening here? How much of this is present with what's really happening and how much of this is based on the past? Yeah, that, that, that's a really interesting thing. You, you mentioned this idea of responsibility. What do you think is that line? Because I, I think this is where a lot of people maybe have confusion or they can even get triggered by hearing something like that, where obviously we all have a past, things happen to us and, mm -hmm. and, and that affects us. Mm -hmm. But, but what, is, what is kind of that line between recognizing that, that we have a past, something happened to us, but then also realizing 
potentially only we can be responsible now for our present. So how do we how do we take what happened in the past, come to terms with that, and then realize that it is the past and that I'm here now in the present <laughs> and responsible for that. <coughs> yeah, I think this is a this is a controversial area, I think, these days. The, I don't know if it's only these days, but you know, I can get into victim blaming and all this stuff pretty quickly. And I think there are levels to it. Uh, but ultimately, I am responsible for my experience of reality. I'm 100% responsible for my experience of reality. And if there are people who live in concentration camps who can find freedom within that concentration camp, or if there are people who are experiencing the worst possible conditions of oppression of, of whatever that we would deem horrible and can find freedom and liberation inside of that, then that's possible for anybody. And, and I think that that is true. I think ultimately my responsibility is, or my experience is my responsibility and how I'm interpreting the situation is my responsibility. At the same time, yeah, there is stuff that goes on in consensus reality that is shitty. <laughs> there, there can be stuff in a workplace, for example, that is really happening. And, and it's not that I'm just being triggered and that it's my past and my trauma that's causing this thing to happen. Like there's something really happening there. But my reaction to that, my response to that is my responsibility and my choice. And it gets to a point, if I don't like it, I can either accept it or I can leave. And there are, yeah, there are situations where you can't leave. And so then if you want to follow a spiritual path, the choice is to accept it. And that is something that you can't say to someone who is in uh, what we would call an objectively, I don't know who we is who would call it an objectively shitty situation. But if there's a committee of people that determine, you know, I think most people would say that this or this or this is not a desirable situation to be in. Uh, and it's, it's easy to get into spiritual bypassing and ah, you, it's just, you're just interpreting it badly or you're having a reaction or whatever. I think ultimately that's true and there has to be a level of humanity of connecting with other people. And, and I think if you, if you really, I mean, if you want to do this work with other people, I think there has to be some level of commitment on both sides and there has to be some level of, of of play on both sides, unless you're in like a guru student dynamic where the guru gets to do whatever they want and you give them your total faith. Uh, and there's your healing, your spiritual liberation, your spiritual development is in part dependent on the complete giving of that faith. Uh, and that requires a huge amount of trust and it's a huge other level of responsibility for the person in that position of power and i think in the current political dynamic there's not a lot of that going on anymore how many people have been uh taken down taken out as <laughs> people but men have been taken down taken out for their abuse of power for their abuse of sexuality for their abuse of students and some of the people in those situations are going to identify as victims are going to say that that person abused their power and there are going to be other people who experience those same things and aren't going to say that. And again, I think that, and I really do think there's a way that you can interpret all of that stuff depending on how you want to look at it and what you want to get from it and, and your own agenda uh, and your own past and your own reactivity. I'm not saying that stuff should happen. I'm not saying that stuff shouldn't happen. Um, and yeah, until I think, I think there needs to be a basic level of integrity and, and mutual commitment for that kind of responsibility taking. But if you're always going to go blaming your environment, blaming your environment, blaming other people for what has happened, it's going to stay the same. I, I do think ultimately that freedom or, yeah, it's funny. I was thinking about freedom last night and the freedom from what or freedom to what or liberation of what, but I think that spiritual experience and even connection with other people comes from taking full responsibility for what's happening in a given moment from my experience of reality. It doesn't matter what's happening. Well, that's not a popular narrative, maybe, but I, I believe that to be true. And then, yeah, there's that, there's that in-between space where 
we're also human and we need to relate at a human level and there needs to be some but that it just comes back to that same you can accept it or you can leave unless you can't leave then you can accept it mm -hmm. yeah i mean it, that seems like an important distinction which is like obviously we we do have full responsibility and I mean, do you think one of the things that actually keeps us from taking that full responsibility is, is fear? I mean, because when, when I really boil down this work, if I have to boil it down to one thing that, that keeps us from freedom or liberation, what you were saying, it is fear. And, and I think that can manifest in many different ways. And I think sometimes that, that taking a responsibility, it's very scary. <laughs> Because when we take that leap, it, it, it does, it, it's kind of we're alone in a way. We're alone with, as you said, our integrity, uh, our actions, our thoughts. Uh, and, and so I think for many people, that's kind of a scary thing. And that's why it is obviously much easier to, to kind of point the finger to say, oh, well, it's this person's fault or it's society's fault or it's my partner's fault or it, it, it kind of, it, it disperses that responsibility a bit. Um, but it is tricky, right? Because as you're mentioning, like a, a workplace scenario, you know, it, it's something that can happen, especially maybe in these more like spiritual uh, kind of communities, which is this idea of a mirror, right? That, that everything happens is, is just a mirror. And, and there's truth to that. I mean, mm. it is. <laughs> but there's still the responsibility of taking a stand if, if, you know, as you were saying, like something is out of integrity and that actually takes a lot of strength and, and, and a lot of kind of willpower and responsibility to also stand up for, for what we think is right. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's totally acceptable to have values, to have expectations, uh, to have things that I want. And, and maybe there can be some level of, of, <laughs> <laughs> Some funny words just came into my head, but either like spiritual attainment and enlightenment or the spiritual bypass where I have no preference or concern about what happens or doesn't happen. And I'm just totally happy to go with the flow of everything. Uh, but, you know, like I think if I'm a person who has a job or a partner or, or a house or, you know, it's completely reasonable to have expectations that or wants desires these are the things that i would like from my employment situation and if i'm not getting those things i can complain about it i can make a request about it i can quit my job and you know depending on the relationship between the person and the employer there's either room for mutual growth or not the same in our in a relationship with a partner you know i can have I mean, I could have a long list of things that I desire in a partner and, and then look for that person. I think that actually is going to really get in the way of, of meeting a person because I'm looking to see if they fit my list or not. Um, and yeah, that's been, when I, mean, I talk about these things, but relationship and, and workplace, especially in a spiritual type work environment where people are on these self-inquiry paths and where there is, it's, it's tricky to manage it well. Uh, and then in relationship is definitely where I've had in, in romantic relationship in partner relationship is where I've had the most personal growth where I can really, really, really look at my own reactions to things and, and find a place to take responsibility for it. And then ultimately, I don't know about ultimately, I don't like to ultimatum anything, but, but what is my commitment and what is it that I want? You know what, what I want is a long-term relationship with this person. I want this person in my life. I love this person uh we have a child together i want this to go well for a long time and so in that case what am i willing to give up in order to stay committed to that vision yeah so you you mentioned when you when you when you got interested in in medicine you use this this word like western medicine was potentially treating more of the symptoms and not necessarily getting to the underlying cause. What was it in, in this plant world that you saw that, that did something different? And, and, and how do you think that, that these plants that, that, that we're working with are actually able to address some of those root causes that potentially like an, an allopathic system isn't necessarily able to do? Yeah. Uh...
So I'll start by saying I don't think Western medicine is bad. <laughs> Just, uh, I think it's really important and really helpful. I think complementary and integrative approaches are excellent. Uh, I think, you know, there are certain things that if they happened to my body, I would go to the hospital. And I'm grateful that there are hospitals and I totally appreciate that form of care. But what we see, especially in the West, um, in the in the developed world, there are all these chronic illnesses that Western medicine can't treat. Uh, we can throw a lot of pills at it and, and then more pills to treat the side effects of the first pill and the second pill. Uh, but there's, there's widespread mental illness, depression, anxiety, PTSD, there's heart disease, diabetes, uh, obesity, I don't know if that counts as an official diagnosis, and all these autoimmune diseases. And, and all of these chronic illnesses that Western medicine really has no idea how to treat. It can suppress symptoms a little bit. It can improve the length of life, but not the quality of life too much. And maybe there's Nishi. <laughs> uh, Yeah. Sorry, someone needed to borrow some toilet paper. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't treat anything. It suppresses symptoms and, and yeah, like I said, it, it can improve the, the quantity of life, but not necessarily the quality of it. And sometimes I think it can even decrease the quality of it, relying on pills and, and just kind of feeding the system. Um, and even sometimes looking at integration, I'm going to wander just a little bit, but, but how much of that, this is one of my questions when I was doing this work, like how much of, of what people are still experiencing when they go back into their life is, is a result of them trying to fit into something that no longer fits. So they go back to their office job or they go back to whatever their life was previous to that. And it's uncomfortable and then they start having experiences of or symptoms of depression and anxiety but it's because they're trying to fit into something that their soul knows isn't true anymore uh and how much of integration work or or an integration work that's done in a in a kind of clinical type setting where this one hour session with people doing something like psycho spiritual coaching uh is just to try to help people fit back into that system and it's not making the kind of real change it's not supporting the real flowering process of that person's soul um so that was one of the reasons i kind of stepped back from it, it was just this bigger question for me about what do, what do, how do we even do this what do, what is the real intention of this is it just to help people fit in but your question was about what did i see that plants could do that that western medicine couldn't do <laughs> and i mean almost almost all of my experience with ayahuasca is inside inside shipibo style work so it's with Shipibo people that have learned from other Shipibo people, and some of those people have learned from generations and generations inside their own families. And it's a complete psycho-spiritual, psycho-emotional, physical, spiritual, medical practice. It includes ayahuasca ceremonies and working with plant spirits and, and working with dieta to train to be able to do those ceremonies, but it also involves working with plants as remedies to treat physical symptoms, to treat energetic symptoms, sometimes to treat spiritual stuff. Um, so it's this really complete system, and I think the biggest things that I, I saw that it could reach was, yeah, Western medicine can deal with physical stuff really well, but it's lacking in emotional, psychological stuff. You can bring in therapies that deal with emotions and psychology to a certain extent. Energetics is another level, and, and you can bring in acupuncture, you can bring in herbalism, you can bring in systems that work at the energetic level as well, and then there's spirituality. You can bring in complementary practices that touch on spirituality, but this was a system, a complete system that for me included all of that. And I've studied a bit of Chinese medicine, and I think there's a spirituality that's kind of woven into that, um, but still the, the medicine was somehow separate from the spirit not that the spirit wasn't treated but there wasn't it wasn't uh there was like religion and medicine and i don't know if that's an accurate reading of of how chinese medicine works but there's religion and medicine and there's different religions and then different practices of chinese medicine but then this the shipibo medicine system is uh is a whole in and of itself 
Uh, and so sometimes somebody needs a physical spiritual treatment or sometimes they need an energetic emotional treatment or sometimes they need just a spiritual treatment uh, and there are ways of doing all of that so i think and what it opened in me so seeing that with other people seeing the kinds of openings that other people had over and over and over and over again healing seeing healing of chronic conditions that shouldn't have a cure based on their descriptions in western medicine uh, and, and seeing the deeper levels of experience of life that I was able to reach uh, investigating plant worlds and medicine practices. Uh, I, I mean, I continue. <laughs> it's not over. I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing because even in what we would consider Western medicine, which, which has its roots in in, in uh, Greek philosophy or even Egyptian philosophy, the idea of spirit was integral in that. There, there wasn't a separation between medicine and spirit. They were, mm -hmm. they were very intricately intertwined. And you, you mentioned this idea that the kind of when you came to this work, you were, you were alternating between atheism and uh, agnosticism. It seems like I mean, that's a very common thing nowadays. <laughs> it, it almost seems like the more, I guess you could say we progress as a society, at least in material things, that, that's a really common phenomena. And, and it seems like a lot of people, you know, even words like religion or spirituality, sometimes they, they have these strange connotations. Do you think, do you think that a lot of the, the reason we're, we're suffering is because we've actually gotten removed from that spiritual aspect and that that's something that that this plant work actually begins to to reintroduce us to because it, it seems like such a common phenomena people do come down as atheists or agnostic and then they have these experiences and somehow it completely shifts their worldview to realize that there was actually something they were lacking in this realm of of spirit uh yes <laughs> yeah i do i do i think that disconnect that is she uh from soul from spirit is something that contributes hugely to the western condition or the and I don't, I mean, I'm not an anthropologist, I'm not a historian, I don't know when it started, the rationalist movement, uh, the domination of nature, uh, agriculture, the <laughs> I mean, agriculture in a dominating kind of way, or, or thinking that we have power over nature, and the separation, the believing ourselves to be separate selves and then experiencing the world largely mentally uh and then yeah forgetting about this whole spiritual dimension this whole soul experience of being alive that allows for a richness of being allows for a compassion toward other people um and i mean i don't know where that fits in because religion and spirituality are not the same thing uh, and you can look at things that have been done in the name of religion, and there's some pretty horrible things that have been done in the name of religion, in the name of God. And that might be why some people are turned off at the idea of spirituality from the onset. Because, uh, I mean, for me, my, my whole understanding or... Um, hold on just a sec. Anda! Uh, yeah. Who's she? He's chewing the Stella. You can't do that. Go. <laughs> um, it's super hot here also. <laughs> um, I think my whole experience or my whole exposure to spirituality was through the lens of Catholicism because my extended family was Catholic. Uh, and so that's all, this is like a really prescriptive fear of God, guilt-based way of understanding 
spirituality, I guess, or religion. Uh, it's really prescriptive, do this, don't do that, or else. <laughs> that didn't sit very well with me. Uh, I don't think that's the same kind of, yeah, compassionate mm, or mystical or, or expansive experience that a lot of spiritual seekers uh, are looking for, or this oneness, this connectedness. Um, but I remember a guy one time, I was on a plane and there was a guy next to me and I don't know, I, I was talking to him a little bit and I think he was on his way to a religious convention or something and he was, a, he was from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I just, I kept asking him a couple questions and, and I didn't know anything about this religion. This was on a trip to or from Peru, I think this was not while I was still trying to understand religion and I don't really continue to try to understand religion. Um, I'm much more interested in direct experience, but the point of his interpretation of his religion was basically once you accept Jesus into your heart, you're already saved. And I think there's something in that that's really beautiful. Like once you accept Jesus into your heart, once you accept the reality of God or of the universe or of connectedness or of whatever, whatever another person might call it. It's like the Course in Miracles channeling this kind of Christ consciousness. And once you accept that into your heart as real, you're already saved. It's not some next life kind of thing. It's like that peace that comes, and you're the one that talks about this. People know the peace of God. The peace that comes with that knowing that nothing can actually be touched. I think that's also really helpful in taking responsibility for your own experience. Because if you can remember that, like, oh, I'm angry in this moment because I think that somebody's doing something to me, but actually who I am is this infinite expansiveness and nothing can ever happen. Then this other thing that's happening becomes really petty and insignificant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned earlier this idea um, that you were very fascinated by this indigenous way of, of working with plants. And, and obviously you mentioned, I think very wisely not to like fetishize them or put them on a pedestal, but obviously these, these traditions do have roots and they do have a long history. So what was it about that way when, when you experienced that, that you saw was operating differently? Did, was there a different power, a different depth, or, or just like obviously something really drew you to that? Mm -hmm. I guess a different level of being. Because my first exposure would be, it was in, in ceremony. There wasn't a lot of one-on-one -on -one interaction outside or, or a personal interaction. My first trip to Peru, I couldn't speak Spanish. My first time that I went to diet, I could barely speak any Spanish at all here. Um, so there wasn't a lot of verbal connection, but there was still a, a connection of being that was possible. Um, but I, I think there was just a level of mastery of, of being and maybe not in everybody, maybe it was just in certain people that that really impacted me. And the first, but it was also the, the living connection to the entire jungle, the entire forest. So that's the home of the spirits, that's where the ancestors spirits live that's where the current plants live and the previous plants have lived so there's something about the physical geographical energetic spiritual location of it all that was also important and yesterday was indigenous people's day and i was thinking a little bit about it and just the yeah the strength of these traditions that they have managed to stay alive in spite of however many generations of colonization, of genocide, of, of intentional attempts to destroy these traditions, and yet they remain. I think there's something in that, that speaks to the strength of the practice. 
I think that's really beautiful. And it's not like every Shipibo person still practices medicine in this way. No, not at all. There's a certain number of people, just like not everybody's a doctor in Western society. You know, some people train to be doctors and a lot of people don't. And, and a lot of people have been evangelized and colonized and don't believe in plant practices anymore. Um, but yeah, I, I don't... I could maybe just say that it was a soul thing also, because it wasn't like I had some previous agenda of I'm going to go sit with indigenous people and learn. And there's nothing wrong with that. People do that. There's nothing wrong with that. But I didn't have that. Uh, but once I experienced it, it was like, ah, wow, this is where I want to be. And these are the people that I want to be learning from. Um, yeah, and then, I mean, in particular, when Romola was there, and working with him, there was something that opened in me. There was a, a, a level of responsibility that I saw in him in, in, in completing the job of like, I am with you until this is finished. And that spoke to something very deeply in me. Um, and I was able to deposit my trust in a huge way. Uh, and so that started as a healing relationship and and has obviously turned into a romantic relationship and a lifetime relationship. We have a child together. We're in a relationship for life. Um, so it wasn't, it was a lot more personal for me. It was a lot more personal. There's definitely a quality of really wanting to learn directly from indigenous people, but there was also one person that called to me in a really strong way that touched something in my soul. Uh, so that yeah like i said i didn't have this conscious agenda or this plan of how it was going to happen definitely didn't i didn't have a conscious plan something may have had a plan and i believe that something did and does have a plan for how all of this is unfolding but i just had to listen to that call yeah so what would you say for, from your experience working at the temple or working outside when when people are coming and they're sitting in the ceremony I guess, first of all, do you see common archetypes of why people are coming? And then in that ceremonial space, how would you describe what is actually happening? And it was interesting because, you, you, you know, you, you mentioned this idea of Romolo, who's, a, who's a, a curandero, a doctor, staying with someone until they were finished. So what does that mean? So uh, I, I guess on the one hand, I guess it's a three-part question. <laughs> <laughs> Why are people coming down? Um, what is actually happening with the plants? And then, and then maybe what is that role of, of the curanderdo, as you mentioned, you know, not only working on someone, but going with them through this journey and staying with them until the end? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've seen people come for, in really broad categories, healing. <laughs> My voice went a little bit funny there. <laughs> healing. <laughs> yeah, oh, I, I want to heal just a little bit. <laughs> there is that archetype of people. We could break the archetypes down into further archetypes or meta archetypes. But yeah, it, I mean, very broadly, people come for healing. People come for or self-discovery or, or direction. What's my purpose in life? Uh, people come for spiritual development. And then there's another class of people that come to learn the practice of being a curandero. And, and those might be people that start out at the temple, for instance, but that's not the place that they do that learning. Um, but maybe uh, that's why people come to Peru. So maybe that's not why people are originally coming to a retreat center, but it might be something that speaks to them during their retreat. Ah, yeah, I want to learn this. Um, but yeah, basically healing direction or understanding, self-understanding and spiritual development. So some people that already have a religious or a spiritual practice for many years are looking for that direct experience of, of what is this, this. Um, yeah, I think really broadly, that's that. And then there are people who are 100% committed to that intention. And there are people who have some fear still and are not 100% clear in their intention. And then there are people who are maybe not quite ready yet and still come. Uh, and I think that that previously existing intention in relation with the healers and the work that happens 
somewhat predicts the outcome of, of how far that goes. Some people are just like, I'm in, no matter what it takes, I'm going to heal or I'm going to have this experience, and not as an expectation, but as a commitment. That intention is 100% pure. It doesn't matter what needs to happen. I'm in. There's other people that are like, I'm in up to a certain point. <laughs> but if I have to do this, no. <laughs> if I have to see a tarantula, no. Or if I have to do this thing, no. And that's that fear holding back. And then there's people who maybe just, you know, they're, they're looking for something. Uh, and that's maybe one of the risks with the globalization, popularization of ayahuasca. They're looking for something. They're looking for healing or there's a sense of desperation and they've tried so many things and that's not quite it. And they come and drink ayahuasca and, and maybe they're not quite ready for that yet. And I think that does happen. And so that connects into the plants and the, and the work that the healers are doing because uh, traditionally the patients didn't drink ayahuasca. The doctors did. The doctors use ayahuasca as a tool to diagnose, to treat, to sing in ceremonies, to, to be able to see what needs to be done and then give other plants as remedies. Um, well, the patients didn't traditionally do that. And, and there's something, there are many things that happen when the, the patients also drink ayahuasca. There's an ability to connect more deeply with the experience uh, the emotional experience or the spiritual experience and actually see what's going on as the doctors are doing that work, maybe not in the way that they see it, but in, in our own way. Um, there's a, a serotonin effect in the brain that helps make new neuronal connections uh, that can be really helpful when there's healing work going on. It makes the brain more plastic and, and able to make new connections and therefore new choices and new, forge new paths ahead. Um, yeah, and then there's a physical purging effect that happens, uh, which is really helpful for cleaning the body. And there are other forms of, of vomitivo, there's other forms of purging and cleaning the body that can happen, but ayahuasca also does that, so that can be really helpful for the healing process. The doctors that are working have dieted many plants to be able to sing and do what they do, uh, but they've, all, they've also learned from teachers to be able to sing and practice and do what they do. So there's a combination of using different energies of different plants in ceremonies, uh, and then also what has been transmitted and shared with them and the practice that, that has gone on. So there's a, a certain amount of learning that happens directly from plants through a process of dieta. And then there's also how much of that has been given to or opened in them through their teachers. Um, in, a, in a healing, process the patient might also take other plant remedies so those plants might be used either in perfume form or or taken as remedies uh drunk or steamed or bathed or or used in a variety of forms that the plants can enter into the body both physically and energetically um so yeah, I guess you could say that the, the, the spirit level happens more through intention and through song. And then the physical level happens more through actual physical use of the plants. And there's a combination of that that's happening in the ceremony. And then, yeah, the, the curanderos have trained for a really, really long time to be able to do, to know how to do what they do. Um, and I'm not sure what else to say about that. I, I, there's a lot, a lot that I could say about that, but I think... Uh, I know that you're interviewing some other actual Shipibo Kuraideros and, and <laughs> they could speak about that better than I can. Not that I can't, but, but they can. Well, from your experience, what, why do you think that's important? I mean, because I think a, a lot of people may have the idea that, and, and I think people hear this a lot, that it's the plants doing everything. So why couldn't uh -huh. someone just drink the plant and say, oh, well, I just have, I have faith that the plant's going to do everything it needs to do, um, rather than yeah. actually sitting in front of someone who has trained for, for years and, and, and done all of these dietas and is singing. And why, why is that part of the experience also so important? Okay. Yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you. Um, Yeah, I think, you know, if someone just drank ayahuasca in their house, it's possible that they would purge, vomit, clean themselves in some way, and it's possible they might have some insights about something, and that would be therapeutic in and of itself. Um, but, somebody's at the door. Um, the, 
it's it's a full medical practice and it's really difficult to understand uh from the outside it's really difficult to understand without having experienced it it's difficult to understand even just seeing it without really having experienced it um but it's a full medical practice and the people that are working in those ceremonies are doctors and so it's like it's like giving somebody a scalpel and saying yeah go ahead do heart surgery on yourself it, it's not going to happen it's just not going to happen and i think that like point it's not going to happen and so i think depending on what the intention is you know if someone's intention is enlightenment then a lot of the stuff in between doesn't actually matter because maybe in one experience with ayahuasca the person becomes permanently enlightened and never needs any other work uh, but the, the chances of that i think are statistically really unlikely <laughs> Uh, there might be a moment of, of an enlightenment type experience, but with what people are looking for, with what people are, are seeking, yeah, the amount of training that it takes to be able to navigate an ayahuasca space for yourself and then to be able to navigate that space for somebody else is, is tremendous. And so there's things that happen at energetic and spiritual levels that that doctor is required to be able to do that work. And that doctor is working with their ancestors, with the plant spirits, with the tools and practices that have been developed over time that are put into that person's practice. And, and each person is going to have a slightly different practice, even if it's within the same medical system. Um, I'm trying to think of a good analogy for it aside from just doing heart surgery on yourself or why it's actually so important. But I think, I mean, another side of it, you know, if you drink ayahuasca on your own, you open yourself up to a lot of things that you can't necessarily control. And so if you do believe in spirits, and even if you don't believe in spirits and energetics and, and things, you might open yourself up to stuff that you have no idea what's coming in and out of your system. And so I think having somebody there that knows how to control that energetic environment and space and keep it safe first of all, and then also be able to go in and, and do the work or create a space so that you can do that work for yourself. And that's a lot of the way that we work now is, is really working on creating a space and, and empowering that person as much as possible to do their own work. Uh, and then still, there's stuff that needs help. There's stuff that needs support. This needs aligning or this needs cleaning or this needs adjusting. But as much as possible, creating a space, even a joint space where that person is empowered to discover things for themselves. And creating that kind of space is really an art. Uh, and that's something that, and maybe an example would be working with a therapist. If you work in a session with a therapist, it's kind of like trying to discover something for yourself on your own, it's possible. But then when there's this kind of witness shared space, that a therapist can help guide point at things that you might not have otherwise seen for yourself and if that's happening primarily at a at a psychological emotional level a little bit energetic sometimes imagine that expanded to to energetic and spiritual dimensions where here's this guide that can help you discover those things for yourself uh that not everybody works in that way uh, some of it's just bit like you need healing. Uh, this thing needs taking out of your system. We're going to do that. Uh, but but I think there's a real spectrum to the work. And, and it's, even if none of that made any sense, it is very important. Uh, it's a whole other level of, of experience of working with ayahuasca to, to work with people who know what they're doing, to work with doctors who've trained in this way. Uh, and yeah, to respect the traditions that have managed to stay alive for this long. Yeah. You, you mentioned <laughs> this idea of plant spirit, and, and I'm sure a lot of people who are listening, they've worked with plants, they, they, they may even themselves have some sense of what that means. But I think a lot of people don't, and maybe even a lot of people who have worked with these plants don't really understand that concept. And, and obviously, it is something very personal. But from from your perspective, how would you how would you describe that to someone? That that idea of of a plant spirit, because obviously that that's very foreign to many people. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, uh, hold on.
And I guess just to say, it's 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 very personal too. Not not that there really is an answer, but just because you use that word, so uh-huh. what is what what does that mean to you? Or, or or maybe what's another way of describing that to people who who that may just be a, a very foreign concept. Difficult to put it into words because it's kind of like a felt sense, and everybody might have a slightly different relationship with what plant spirit means. What I imagine is something that. Uh, it's like the full personality being of a plant that doesn't exist in this realm, but exists in another realm. And, and, and maybe a dream space is a close interpretation of, of the felt sense of that. If there's like a really vivid dream, um, or I'm trying to imagine for someone who hasn't had any of these types of experiences, what would be the closest way to describe it? I don't think it can really be described. I think you have to experience it. And some people haven't experienced it. And that's totally fine. Um, it's not necessary to experience plant spirits. But I think, yeah, there's a communication that's possible in another way. So it's not something that's happening necessarily in words. It's, it's like I can experience what I know to be the energy or the presence of a particular plant. And for me, it'll have some visual qualities. It'll have some emotional qualities. It'll have some color qualities. It'll have some healing qualities. And all of that comes as part of what I experience as the spirit of this plant. And, and then sometimes there might be a moment where that's the appropriate plant to be guided by or sometimes it wants to help me with something depending on the plant depending on the diet and i think it's pretty normal for people who haven't dieted to not have any connection with plant spirits but at the same time there are people who have really strong experiences of things without having dieted they'll just feel the presence of all of these living plant entities by being in the jungle i don't know maybe that approximates an answer (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, f- from my experience, I mean, we were, we were kind of talking about the West in generic terms, but it, it seems in this idea of spirituality, it, it seems like that's something maybe we've, we've lost connection with because, I mean, to me, it seems like all over the world, there were these traditions that very potentially used plants, but th- th- there, there may have been other ways that they, they access this what you said like this other reality and you know i think one of the things plants like ayahuasca does is it it, is it heightens our our senses It, it opens us to to a perception that we may not have in this reality and and in that way a tremendous amount of healing or insight or learning can take place um do you think I mean, uh, again, there, there's a balance, you know, because this is this is our, our functional reality. This, this is the reality we need to operate to cook our food, to drive our car, to to do things. And and a lot of people would say that's the power of a ceremony. Is it's a specific time and a place or a dieta? It's it's a time and a place where we go into this state which is very altered, but it's also not necessarily meant to be a state we're operating in all the time. We, we eventually have to come back to this reality. Do you think that's something that, that potentially a lot of us are missing and, and that's why potentially we're reaching to these plants and ceremonies is because we've lost that, that kind of ceremonial aspect or, or that, that period in our lives where we take time out to actually go into this heightened sense of perception to to be able to learn things on a different level or, or to have insight that we may not necessarily get in this reality? Yeah, I think that, yeah, one thing you said there that's really important, and I don't know exactly the words that you said, but that ayahuasca is a tool or ayahuasca is a medium or ayahuasca is a way in which we can experience these other realms, the spiritual dimension, or connect with plant spirits. Uh, And I think that's really important to emphasize, just like it's important, I think, to work with doctors, to work with people who are trained in in this work. Uh, I think it's important to remember that ayahuasca is a tool. Ayahuasca is not the focus. Um, 
we see it a lot of the time where people, and I definitely did this, became kind of a new identity as an ayahuasca person, as an ayahuasca drinker, and it's like ceremony and ceremony and ceremony. And that's something I think that was really grounding in in getting to know indigenous curanderos better, is that like in between ceremonies, they're real people <laughs> playing soccer and, and having families and fishing and canoeing and and carrying plantains and and sitting with friends and talking and really normal life uh you know, and not only talking about ayahuasca all the time and and definitely there are moments where that kind of work talk is important and interesting and inspiring and you know investigating together what is going on but it's not just only ayahuasca all the time <laughs> and i think that's really healthy <laughs> have a balanced life um and it, you know it might be important in in some spiritual practice you know you might go into isolation for five years or uh, that might be in dieting or that might be in buddhist retreat or you know and that might be an important part of your personal spiritual process but depending on the level of of renunciation and the type of embodied spirituality you choose to live in your life it, it doesn't need to be just that all the time um at the same time, yeah, I think the loss of connection to spirituality largely comes from a loss of ceremony. And so, yeah, there are lots of other traditions and lots of other access points to spirituality. It doesn't need to be ayahuasca. There's extended fasting. There's, there's heat, sweat lodge type ceremonies. There's other plants. There are lots and lots of other practices, physical practices, breath practices that help access that spiritual realm. And sometimes that's used as a pure spiritual practice. Sometimes that's used as a diagnostic medical practice. Uh, sometimes it's a combination of those things. Um, but absolutely that loss of connection to ceremony, that loss of connection to nature feeds the loss of connection to spirituality and to the complete experience of human life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So your life has taken a, a change. <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned Romulo. He's, he's someone I know. I, I have a lot of respect for. He's, he's a Shipibo doctor. Um, <laughs> and you have a child now. <laughs> he's my buddy. <laughs> Hola. Hola. <laughs> Como te va? I got my earphones in, so you can't hear. He wants the earphone in in his ear too. Want to hear? Hola. <laughs> <laughs> this is Osi. This is Osi. It is Uni. Oh, I wanna I wanna have this in my ear, yeah. Yeah, this is. <laughs> Yeah, ciao. <laughs> it's a perfect oh, timing. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so yeah, we've taken a bit of a, a turn in things. Yeah, I... You know, I had a ceremony where I was looking at my life, I was looking at my situation, and I had this really strong experience of communicating with a soul of, of what could be a child that wanted to come. Uh, this is before I got pregnant, before I, uh, uh, sometime, and it was at the temple. Hi. <laughs> what do you want? Leche. I'm gonna, gonna do this. Uh, hola. Yeah. You know, when I was, and I was together with Romolo, and and I was like, yeah, this is my life. This is the work that I do, and and I would be your mother, and then this is your father and this is his life and this is our relationship and this is exactly how it is and if you want to come you're totally welcome to come and if you don't want to come I understand <laughs> and, and so I issued this invitation and it was conscious um, but it wasn't like rational conscious it was soul conscious if I can make a distinction between those things it was like yeah this is yeah I'm gonna this invitation is happening this is happening in my interaction with this moment in this ceremony um, 
And not too long after that, I did get pregnant and it wasn't planned. Uh, and it was, it was not a surprise. I had also dreamed some really specific aspects of how it all played out uh, in diet. And so it wasn't surprising. It wasn't surprising, but it was shocking to me. Uh, and it was, it, it was, my pregnancy was the most transformative experience that I have been through. Uh, and I think it's really possible for, for women to engage with pregnancies in a really spiritual way. Uh, for me, it was deeper than diets. It brought up all of my attachment stuff and abandonment stuff and a deep fear of being alone. And I think that was my biggest. And I just, I didn't want to be alone ever. I would just, I cried so much when I was pregnant and I didn't want to do anything. And I was so nauseous and it was so, it was a really difficult pregnancy. Um, and it felt for me like the first three, four months of it was the test of me. I was like, are you sure? Are you sure? Cause I could go somewhere else. <laughs> like, I'm fine. <laughs> and then it felt like the first four or five months, uh, whatever it was, that was a month more than that. Um, was a test of the relationship. Because it was like, actually, I need both of you. Uh, I need both of you to be able to do this, to be able to come into this. And, and once that kind of passed, then my, my nausea kind of subsided also, and I was kind of okay for a little bit. And then there were other challenges, and it was just, and then I just got so big and uncomfortable and hot. <laughs> it was really, really challenging. And there was this huge identity crisis that happened. <laughs> Whereas like, but what about like a lot of, I didn't realize how much I had become identified with my work and with helping people. Um, and, and it got to a point where I just, yeah, I worked for a little bit while I was pregnant and then I kept doing behind the scenes work with the temple. Um, but I couldn't do work with people anymore. It was too energetically difficult to, to be trying to do any kind of, any kind of therapeutic coaching, even let alone energetic work with people while I was pregnant because this needed all of my attention. Um, yeah, and so a huge, a huge letting go, a huge identity crisis, a, a huge what's going to happen, like what is going to happen, where am I going to be, how is this going to work, how is this going to work, um, but it's been super amazing. He was born, he doesn't ever stop moving. <laughs> he was born super fast and that's his whole character he came into my body like boom and he came into the world like boom and he's like i'm here and i can be a baby for a little bit because that's what's required but you know can we get it over with already because i got stuff to do <laughs> he's yeah, a total force of nature and combination of his parents in <laughs> the best and worst ways uh and it's been, yeah, it's been such a great grounding, grounding process for me. Uh, and we're living in Pucallpa and I've hardly been alone ever. There's like a couple hours that go by sometime when I'm alone with him and other, the rest of the time there are always people around and always community around, family. Um, which at first was a bit of an adjustment because I'm not used to living that way. I've been pretty independent for a long time. Um, but it's like watching kids grow up, watching my child grow up this way, which is something that's so culturally different from what I've seen, even from the way that I grew up, it was already, you know, fairly protected. There are other kids in the neighborhood, but fairly protected. And now I don't think you see kids in the street the same way. You see kids at the park with their parents maybe, but for a little chunk of time and there's play dates for a little chunk of time. But here there's other kids that come around all the time and there's like a million aunts and uncles that are always here and I feel comfortable leaving him with with most of them and you know I can go to the bathroom and I can do laundry and I can I, I can go to the bathroom and do laundry and shower and nap and cook and clean and try to keep up on my work and build a new nonprofit organization and at the same time <laughs> but there's such a, a variety of adult influence to teach him uh grandparents that come around all the time and and aunts and uncles and then cousins and then other little kids and sisters to play with 
And so even this whole quarantine, the extended family comes because the extended family is still the core family and and he's got all these other kids all the time to play with. And I just see every piece of that being so healthy. And, and I feel daily connection and joy and abundance. And in a way that where it's difficult for me to program an hour to talk to somebody, but it's like, I, I have no lack of, of, connection and joy and people in my life and before it was like I needed to program these little concentrated one hour chunks of time to be able to to fill a need for connection or something where there's like oh we only have this much time let's try to fit it all in and then I'll see you again in a month or whatever and now there's this kind of like knowing that people will come and go people from the family will come and go but nobody's ever really gone there's this sense of them here all the time which is really different and and I think healthy. <laughs> so I've been, yeah, I've been in a, a physical process, I think, um, that's allowing for a, a deeper kind of embodiment of, of spirituality, of kind of like day-to-day -day spirituality. I haven't been chasing other realms so much. I still practice ceremony regularly. Uh, I've been dieting. Um, but there's also this kind of like day-to-day, -day, how do I treat other people? thing that's become important for me and, and a lot less i mean i can't sit down and read a book i I, you, <laughs> I haven't read a book i don't watch movies really I, I don't you know there's like anything that requires a long period of time to focus it's, it's kind of if i have a chance to do that it's it's on other things um and i think you know once i started my my own spiritual inquiry process i kind of stopped reading books there have been a few books that i've read and a few thinkers that i really admire but for the most part, I'm more interested in direct experience and, and not trying to fit my experiences into somebody else's interpretation of it. I think books are really great. I think that a lot can be learned from them if you use it as a guide, a way to point at things that exist in you. But I've seen a lot of people get really confused reading too many books also. Um, yeah, so I don't read a ton of books, read a ton of movies, but I just try to enjoy and then learn how to concentrate and find like little millisecond moments of stillness inside of <laughs> what might appear objectively as chaos there's always people coming and going and people laughing and crying and running around and yeah it's a it's a really full experience of life that I have right now and then yeah for that to also be happening inside of a medicine family uh for my child for him to be learning Shipibo which I don't even know why it's important for him to learn uh an indigenous language, an original language. Like, I can't make a rational, I could make some rational or anthropological arguments for it, but it is important. It is important to me that he learns Shipibo and that he's here and then growing up with this living culture that still has some connection to something that we've been so disconnected from in the West. Yeah. Yeah, I interviewed uh, Joe Tafour recently and, and he was mentioning I think it was a doctor from, from somewhere in Africa. I can't remember his name or, or where he's from, but he was saying that, that he was seeing a, a lot of the, the ailments we're dealing with from his perspective come from three things or a lack of three things. One is spirituality, which we, we touched on. People have become disconnected to, to spirit. The second was community, that actually people have become disconnected to community. We've become very isolated, maybe overly independent, um, and then the third one was disconnected to nature. So many people live in cities and we're between our car and our, our home and our work. And we've kind of lost that connection to nature, to, to natural law, to, to a sense of awe of, you know, just looking at the stars and connecting to trees. Um, so, yeah, the, I think that's really interesting what you're describing. Um, I mean, I, I know Romolo, I, I have a lot of respect for him. He, he, he probably, I can't say he worked the hardest, although maybe, but he definitely worked the longest of <laughs> anyone I've ever seen in ceremony. Um, but I think that speaks a lot to his character. So what is, what has that been like, as you said, being part of a medicine family and, and, uh, I mean, obviously being very close to someone who, who does come from a long lineage and um, is, is there anything you've learned from that? I, I mean, on a personal level, but also in the medicine space of, of just 
what that commitment is and, and what that lineage means to, to him and now maybe to you. Um, because that, that, you know, I, I agree. I, I think that is something that's really important is, is keeping that lineage alive. And mm -hmm. obviously, I mean, I think it was Isaac Newton who said, if I've done anything great, it's only because I've, I've stood on the shoulders of giants. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think all of us were, no matter what we're doing, we, we, we're, we're privileged in a way that we we take all of the knowledge that came before us and we're able to start at a at a a more advanced point because of that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't I don't think I'll talk too much about it just because it's it's partly not mine, partly uh, it's sacred. Uh some, yeah, it's sacred, and I feel really grateful to be shared with in the ways that I'm shared with, to be included as part of the family. Um, and I mean, one of the things that has become more clear to me, clear to me, more clear to me, clear to me, because maybe I didn't understand it at all before, was like, yeah, there are many different lineages inside of the Shipibo medicine system. And most of those are family lineage lineages. And not everybody comes from lineage, not everybody comes from a medicine family. There are people who are Shipibo who have learned recently, um, uh, other people who have learned for a couple generations, other people who have long generations of, of learning yeah, some people who have, have learned very, very recently and then are practicing and, and masquerading as as shamans to help heal people. And it's, it's, a, it's a thing that happened um, with the, the globalization, the popularity of ayahuasca. There's a lot of Westerners that come to the jungle looking for healing, looking for spiritual development, looking for an ayahuasca experience. Um, and with that provides a lot of opportunity for for money for power for for misuse of a system that is sacred uh, and so yeah I, I think one of the things that i've learned is that really there are really varied ways of practicing within the overarching system uh, and some of those are more concerned with spirituality and some of those are more concerned with physical healing it's also different levels of healing um, Another thing is that, yeah, it is sacred. And, and there's something in it, the, the felt sense of the importance of it that I can really feel and just know that it is important, that it continues, that it is protected, that it is um, carried forward in a good way. It's difficult to put into words. <laughs> Here comes my little buddy again. Hola. <laughs> um. <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing? Mm. Huh. He's got the Tanya tuft of blonde hair right in the front. I know. He's come out with super light hair. Oh, yeah, my fetchy. Yeah. Uh, what else have I learned that feels appropriate to share? Yeah, I think I think those are the most important things for now. Just that it is sacred, that it is important, that that people who have that do practice this, it is to be respected uh, and to be treated with respect and with humility and with curiosity, um, and and to give a certain amount of trust that people who have been practicing this for a long time have sacrificed a lot to be able to to practice it, to continue to hold it as a huge responsibility. Um, it's not necessary that 
that anybody shares this with us as outsiders and to the people that do just you know coming into it with a certain amount of humility and respect like i said uh, of gratitude and using those as connection points um it's easy to forget all that stuff but yeah i think it's uh, <laughs> you know they're also human beings oh somebody wants to see videos Hey, anda fuera así. Eso todavía, todavía. Ya, no, no necesitas videos. Hey, 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 no. Hey, más leche. Así, así. Te te. No, a distraer. <laughs> kind of a convoluted answer <laughs> yeah well how do you do you have any like idea or how do you see the future playing out do you do you feel like you still want to continue to work with people in that way working in that ceremonial space with Rodomolo separate work integration do you have do you have any idea how how you see the future playing out uh what we're so we do work in ceremony sometimes together uh which is i love i love it i love it i love it it's wonderful i love yeah i think i've become more interested and i don't ever imagine myself being someone who runs ceremonies on my own um because why i mean maybe maybe one day but uh, like i don't see that being my path uh but i do love working in ceremony i do love working with people in ceremony supporting in ceremony uh and and yeah i think that what's possible in in ceremony work and with the help of doctors and then with the help of diets just reaches into levels that other things never can um i love having a close relationship with i mean yeah it's like the ideal are, are loving partners that also work with people, whether it's energetically or therapeutically. It's, it's, a, it's an ideal that I have. It's something that I hope that we carry well when we do work with other people. Um, and I think it's a really beautiful thing that allows for an even greater access to, to healing spirituality, whatever the balance of masculine and feminine, but then also the modeling of, of mother and father, whether that's personal or universal. There's something beautiful that comes in that complement. So, I love that work that we do. Um, we're also, we're starting, a, we're working on, we've been starting, <laughs> there are things coming, uh, a nonprofit organization. Because I think the, the, the conservation of what's important, or not what, I mean, how can I, I can't be the one to say what's important, but I, I at the same time, looking at Shipibo culture as a whole and then looking at the medicine practice within that, I think that the, the medicine practice is a very important piece of the culture, if not the most important piece. And there are other things that happen that that are also part of the culture that are also important. Is, I need to plug in my connection to the, <laughs> to the electric current. Um, so uh, the preservation and inspiration of culture uh and so we have a project that is called unishobo organization intercultural unishobo so it's an intercultural organization uh where we work in three areas we work in art and music and we work in medicine and then we work in environment and i think that those are some of those are three of the main arms uh, that to me are the most important things to be working in right now. And so that's something that could expand outside of Shipibo territory. But for now, that's where we're focused. That's where we're based. Um, so looking at inspiring youth or inspiring other people or just inspiring ourselves with uh, modern expressions of art and music that are based in traditional roots. Uh, so for example, Kumbia Masha, which is Kumbia that's sung in Shipibo and Masha is like a traditional form of, of singing and storytelling. Um, so there, there are people who perform that music. Uh, we're creating a cultural center here where it's, a, it's meant to be a space where people can come together and share ideas, um, 
and, and artists who are painting, who are working in visual arts, who are also using modern expressions uh, and incorporating elements of traditional design, traditional kuna, uh, so keeping some of, the, because I think that everything changes. I think that everything morphs and changes with time. Um, and so finding or encouraging or creating space for that present day connection where there's an expression of something uh, that exists or that has existed and, and how that's taking shape into the future. Um, similarly with medicine, uh, looking at what are the, the ways of practicing that are important now or, or how are they how are they able to shift and grow and how are they not? What are the important things to conserve and preserve? And, and what are the important things or the things that are able to shift and grow? Um, and yeah, looking at actual planting of ayahuasca, looking at different plants and, and uh, special plants, collections, libraries of those things, and then looking at the practice in general and how to inspire or preserve future generations of that. Uh, and then uh, looking at land conservation, uh, right now they're trying to put a, a highway through Betania, right through Romolo's house. Um, so not just through the community, but through his house as a logging company. We think it's a logging company that wants to put in a big highway so that they can more easily bring their trucks in to more easily carry more trees that they cut down out of the jungle and not just through a community where whatever close to a thousand people live, but through his house and his dad's land. His dad's been living there for 50 something years and it's like a collection of traditional ceremonial space and, and trees and medicinal plants and, and they want to put a road there. Um, <laughs> so we're working on that. Uh, that doesn't need to happen. That absolutely doesn't need, it needs to not happen, but we'll see what happens. So we're working with a couple of the organizations here to, to try and put a stop to that, to, to call it out as a crime against nature, crime against culture. Um, other, yeah, conservation. So not just in the immediate, not, not to fight. We don't want to fight, uh, but, but look at what does require or could benefit from conservation. So where are there stands of secondary forest, maybe not primary forest, there's not a lot of that left, but secondary forest, and then how to inspire youth and, and current generations to actually value that and not just be thinking about present moment survival needs, which is a really difficult thing to do when there's more and more dependence on money, less and less work available, um, especially with the pandemic, about how to inspire or rethink or reframe what is important and, and connections to roots and caring about nature. Uh, and then a project that, that we're collaborating with Chai Kuni on. So I don't know what my future is in working with people uh, in, in an integration sense. I think that I'm letting the question of what does integration even mean really percolate through my life experience in a big way before approaching that. I'm not, you know, if people have, if people that we're working with have a, an immediate question or something, that's cool. But um, like I said, I don't know, you know, helping people fit back into society or the system or feel better for a little bit isn't that inspiring for me. Uh, so I don't know what the big picture is that way, but I'm, I'm interested in, in doing real work. And so we have a, a project of Chakras Integrales or, or Integrated Bioforestry. So one of the things is that there's this huge interest in ayahuasca from the outside world from people who don't traditionally use ayahuasca there's more and more of it being harvested than ever before what we hear is that there's less and less of it available people are needing to go further and further into the jungle to find wild ayahuasca there's some people who are planting it other people who are not planting it nobody really knows where their ayahuasca comes from uh, and and so yeah this is a, a project in collaboration with matthew who also wants to do this he's got nine i think chakras integral is already set up in in the loreto region uh part of the problem with ayahuasca is that it needs time to grow and it needs a tree or something to grow onto it's a huge vine and so you need it needs to grow at least five years before harvesting it and for it needs a big structure to become a big vine upon <laughs> and so the best in nature that happens on trees um 
a lot of what happens in the jungle is the slash and burn foresting and monoculture. So people have a patch of land and most of the people that live in communities here have hectares of land. And the communities themselves also have hectares of land. And so whatever family member has a hectare of land, they cut it down, they burn it down, and then they plant plantains or yucca. And it's all monocropping, monoculture. Um, destroys biodiversity uh, and you know it provides a minimal financial return and so there are models of integrated agroforestry that actually intercrop and in in a way replicate nature so there's large wood trees timber trees fruit trees interspersed with things that that come out at different times as permaculture and there's tomatoes and cilantro and whatever else was traditionally planted so working on designing a a uh, traditional Shipibo informed blend of modern permaculture. And, and what we want to have is a model farm here that has a few different plots of land, not a few different plots of land, but a few different model plots within the land that have integrated medicine, food, mini forests. Uh, and then part of the intention of that is that in three years, the trees will be big enough that they can actually take a so, so having, yeah, we want to, we're planning a, a model site for that here that can then be replicated in different Shipibo and non Shipibo communities here in Ufayali, can then be replicated in different families. Uh, and so we want to have a, a seed library, a sprout library, a tool library, where we can give and lend people the tools that they need and, and provide, mm, mm, what's the word, <laughs> educational support, I guess, help thinking through how to plan it and how to actually implement it, provide some, some labor help. Um, and, and ideally they expand into a large scale project so that there's not just pure monoculture happening here, uh, that it is something that's actually contributing to, to biodiversity. This model generates more income for people if they're able to link into a market in a good way and that's questionable sometimes. Um, and then also have a, a foundation for, for ayahuasca growing. So food sovereignty, uh, biodiversity, and then ayahuasca growing and sourcing so for either medicine centers within Peru or for people in an international market, depending on how laws are able to shift. Because right now you can't ship li liquids outside of Peru, but uh, there's lots of different movements happening in the world of, of psychedelics and ayahuasca currently. Uh, and I think, yeah, that, that traceable, uh, respectfully sourced ayahuasca, um, it, I mean, it would benefit from, from and, and you know, I have mixed opinions about whether ayahuasca should be fully legal in different places because of because of the what I think is the need for doctors to be doing that work. But I do think that indigenous people and, and trained practitioners should have access to their medicine legally and freely. Uh, and if that needs to come from Peru or from other places where it's grown, they should be able to ship and, and carry and bring that medicine with them wherever they want to go. I don't know if it should just be blanket legal. I'm not sure. Um, but definitely there shouldn't be any restriction on, on people who are trained to work with it to be able to do that and to be able to ship it. And I think that would contribute to, uh, uh, yeah, sourcing in a good way that isn't illegal, that isn't poaching, that isn't cutting down vines in, in unsustainable ways, that isn't going into, yeah, old growth. Uh, and I mean, look at the loss of the Amazon forest that's also obviously contributing to loss of ayahuasca. And there's 150,000 hectares of forest being lost every year in just Peru. Similar amounts in similar numbers in Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador. Uh, there's a ton of stuff being burned down, cut down for wood, for cattle, for, for agriculture. And so at the small family scale and at the large industrial scale, uh, biodiversity isn't being respected forests are being cut down, burned down, uh, and we're losing a lot of, hmm. uh, I mean, how can, how can you put into words how important the Amazon jungle is for the health of the planet? <laughs> yeah, but that's what, that's what we're working on now. So there's the definitely, all of our work is guided by, by medicine practice. And for me, I think it's in a lot of everything that we're doing, a lot of what we're doing everything that we're doing is is working toward the conservation the preservation the inspiration the the divine love flowering the universe of based in the Shipibo medicine practice uh, and beyond that uh, 
but it, yeah, there's some really hands-on stuff that I'm involved in now that feels a lot more important than, than doing one-on-one -on -one sessions with people. Because we still do ceremonies, we still help people, I think that that's always going to happen. Uh, but also, like, I think that's part of the, the thing is that there was nothing to receive people. And they exist, there's places and, and parts and, and communities and communes and cults and whatever that exist to receive people. And some of those things are good. Um, but a lot of people go back into their life after drinking ayahuasca in the jungle and there's nothing to receive them and they feel alienated from their families, they feel alienated from their friends and their job doesn't work anymore and their, their relationship doesn't work anymore. And, and there's no alternate option. And so people are left with the responsibility of really creating something. And I think that's all right, but I think there are also a lot of people working on creating something uh, regenerative or sustainable or suitable to the longevity of of nature as we know it on the planet including human beings um and that's something that became a lot more important to me to to focus on uh, on on really building that for a little bit uh and then once that's done we'll see <laughs> yeah great great well is there anything else you you want to address that we we haven't talked about I mean, I think we touched on a lot of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, there's nothing. You don't have any other questions. I don't think there's anything else that is burning to come out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Wonderful, Tanya. Yeah, thank you so much. If if people want to get in touch with you or learn more about the, the not-for-profit you're starting or the webinar series, how would they go about doing that? Yeah, uh, so our not-for-profit is Unishobo, uh, which is O-N-I-X-O-B-O dot -O org. Uh, and the email address is info at Unishobo dot org. So O-N-I-X-O-B-O, -O, it means house of wisdom. Um, Uni is also the Shipibo name for ayahuasca. Uni is also the first name of our baby, Unihua, which means wisdom and light. Uh, <laughs> and then Osiris which is the god of death and rebirth. Mm. Um, yeah, so there's that, the webinar series. Uh, we don't have a website for it yet, um, but between River Strix and, and Dr. Bronner's and Icears, if people pay attention to those places, uh, they'll find out about it when it's being published and when those campaigns are being published. Okay, wonderful. Well, I'll put those in the in the show notes too, uh, so people have awesome. access to that. And yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. I I really appreciate it. I I know awesome. taking taking two hours out of your day is is a lot these days, but I I really appreciate it, and I I think and hope people will will get a lot out of of hearing from you. So uh, I thank you. Yeah, again. I hope so too. Come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. We gotta say goodbye to this guy too, who's sad because now it's time to go. <laughs> And now it's time to go. So yeah, yeah, loosen up, loosen up the spirit of giving, give to Jason's Patreon. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was thinking of how would I describe Jason? He's like the living embodiment of the Tao, <laughs> completely balanced and knows the peace of God. And I appreciate that a lot. Uh, and I think it's, I think it's great. And the, the variety of voices that you bring into this podcast, uh, I think it's super cool. So thanks for having me. Hmm. Well, it's my pleasure. And uh, maybe uh, in a few months or a year, we'll, we'll check back in and, and see where things are at. And hopefully, hopefully the pandemic is passed and life somehow continues on. And uh, yeah, and I'll be really curious to see what's what's happening with your your NGO. And, and also, uh, oh, also, we're planning to connect with Romolo to, to, yeah. to get him on. So that'll be great. So hopefully, hopefully you can translate that to, to have a, a good, uh, a good translation coming on. And I'm, I'm really excited to talk to him. He's, uh, I have a lot of respect for him. I, I think he does really amazing work. And uh, I think people really like to hear his voice too. He's, he's a pretty special dude. So yeah, he's got a, he's got a lot to say in a really unique way. Yeah. 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 Cool. Well, great. Well, we'll talk soon and thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you too. Yeah. Bye. Ciao. <laughs> Ciao.
<laughs> maybe in a maybe in a few years we'll have him on too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He'll teach us all something. Yeah. Ciao. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 <laughs> all right, Tanya. Take care. You too. All right, everybody, that is the show. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Tanya is a, is a really wonderful lady, um, and I, I think and hope you got a lot out of that episode. Um, I should have some good guests coming up. Hopefully, the next episode, her partner, Romulo, who's a Shipibo Corandero doctor, will be coming on. Uh, he's a very good Corandero, really interesting guy, so I think that should be a really good episode. Um, uh, hopefully, my friend Marav will be coming Coming on to talk about tobacco, um, and as always, uh, there there should be some other really good guests coming up as well. So, as always, uh, if you can go on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, like the video, turn on the the notification settings, um, and Apple Podcasts, start rating and review. That really helps with the algorithm. So, um, thank you so much to all the Patreon supporters. Thank you. I really support the. The, the, the pledges and the donation and the support. And uh, thank you guys for tuning in and I'll see you in the next episode.